So, Francesca, I have a question. We've talked about everything from black love to black excellence. But today I want to ask you about something that we don't always talk about in polite company. Mm, okay, so it's either politics, religion or money. Yes, money, specifically big money. When I say black wealth, who pops up in your head? Ooh, I would say Oprah, Tyler Perry, Beyonce and her husband. I see the shade tree. You living up under the day, huh? I, I can dig it. I can dig <laughs> no, it. No, 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 that's not. Com- I mean, he is her husband. I didn't lie, did I? I guess since we're talking about the country of Mali, I should also add an African billionaire in there. <laughs> Why? Are, are you trying to lump in the notorious African American who also calls himself Elon Musk? Oh, no, 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 no. Do not say Apartheid Clyde's name or you might summon him here. We're not trying to do that. <laughs> uh, all your answers was good. All of them was good. But they all have small money compared to the guy we're going to talk about today. He wasn't just the wealthiest black person. He was the wealthiest person to exist ever, period. He's just so happy to be black. Today, we're talking about Mansa Musa. He was a titan of commerce, a major backer of higher education, an important figure for the spread of Islam in Africa and the king of the great Mali Empire. And he had more gold than anybody else. I'm talking about more gold than anyone that ever stepped foot on this earth. And he loved to spend and give it away. But his generosity created such terrible inflation that sent Egypt into an economic tailspin for a decade. <sighs> you know what? You're going to get some history and a little economics on this one. Let's get into some black history for real. It's the summer of 1312 in West Africa. The largest kingdom on the continent is in a rush to prepare for a celebration. The merchants haggle for their wares. The butchers parade their fattest livestock for anyone wanting fresh meat. The imam, or religious leader, from the mosque and his council maneuvers through the crowds of Minani, the capital city of the Mali Empire. They're on their way to address the man who is the future of the empire. As the imam and his group of clerics approach, the crowd parts to give them free passage. It's a small sign of respect in keeping with their station. The group continues on their way until they reach their destination at the center of the city, the palace. The holy men make their way towards the front of the packed room. It's full of visitors from all over the world who have come to seek favor from the kingdom with the largest known gold deposits. And once again, the crowds respectfully part to give the clerics right of way until they come face to face with an unflinching woman, the queen mother, Kanku. Kanku silently waits to be addressed, having married the king's brother years ago. Today, her son being named king elevates her too. The imam hesitates and then offers a shallow bow to show respect. Kanku smiles warmly and gestures for the group to follow her to the prince's side. I think something could be said for like technical, like you ride, your son got a title, you get to come up in the title too. That's kind of dope. I mean, it's I still like that. that. You know, you come up, the family's like, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we coming up too? Yeah, but you know, I feel like it'd be unofficial. Like this right mm. here seemed like it was officially yes. like he got he got a title and therefore technically she got a title as well and not like informal. Yeah, I hear you. You feel me? We got a snicker and sneak about mm-hmm. it. The prince, still in his early 20s, holds off addressing the imam as he approaches with Kanku. The prince's slave drape him in fine silks for his historic ceremony later that afternoon. As the minutes pass, the imam's annoyance grows. But he's there on a mission, and if he has to wait, he will. Eventually, Kanku touches her son's shoulder. The conversation with the imam is one that can't be avoided any longer. The prince gestures for them to approach as he sits. Both the prince and the imam seem mildly annoyed. But the imam swallows his pride and launches into a traditional greeting. Assalamu alaikum, or translated, peace be upon you. Wa alaikum salam, 
or unto you peace is the prince's response. The imam hesitates before he continues. Your uncle and his 2,000 ships have only been lost at sea for a very brief period of time. There are those who feel the timing of this ceremony is uh, hasty. Perhaps we could postpone. Kanku slides up to her son as the prince stares back at his visitor silently. The imam chooses to press on. Your uncle was beloved. His advancements in the sciences were what made his expedition so exciting. Who? Kanku interrupts the imam and causes him to startle. Who do you speak of? The imam's eyes dart back and forth between the prince and his mother, confused. The prince clarifies. My mother would like to know who feels my name in ceremony is hasty. Surely these men should stand before me and raise their concerns themselves. Unless the concerns are yours. The soft-spoken rebuke ruffles feathers. My prince, uh, please be reasonable. No. The prince cuts off the mom once more. There is no reasoning for those who see my place in this kingdom as something to question. The ceremony is for my guests and my subjects, but it holds no real power. I do. I shall be Mansa, your king. The prince rises from his chair and waits. The imam and his attendants quickly bow deeply before him. Of course, please forgive the intrusion on your day of celebration. May your reign be long and prosperous. The prince, attended by his entourage of servants, guards, and his mother, exit the castle to the loud delight and admiration of his subjects. Today, is the start of a 25-year reign that will mark the most successful period in the Malian Empire. But the successes will come with a bloody price tag as the new king's untrusting citizens and even his family will soon find out. BP added more than $70 billion to the U.S. economy last year by making investments from coast to coast. Investments like building charging hubs for fleets of electric buses in California and starting up new infrastructure in the Gulf of Mexico. It's and, not or. See what doing both means for energy nationwide at bp.com slash investing in America. VR training platforms like the one developed by Fundamental VR and Orbis International are helping surgeons train over and over before operating on real patients. As you practice each skill, the muscle memory starts to develop. Learn more at meta.com slash metaverse impact. Black is heritage, black is royalty, from head to toe, black is beautiful. From Wondery, this is Black History for Real, where we chronicle the stories of movers and shakers of Black history all over the world. The stories will inspire you, educate you, and more often than not, leave you shaking your damn heads. I'm Francesca Ramsey. And I'm Conscious Lee. This is our three-part series on Mansa Musa and the Mali Empire. Today, we're talking about the beginning of Mansa Musa's reign. In the early 1300s, the Mali Empire was entering its golden age and the young, brashful Musa was looking to take over. During this time, Musa would rise in ranks through a questionable strategy. When he becomes king, he would lead with an iron fist and a large ego. His aggressive and ruthless tactics would help Mali colonize territories throughout Africa, making Mali an economic and diplomatic powerhouse. But soon he would discover the high cost of his tyrannical leadership, one that would change his entire world. This is episode one, Watch the Throne. It's the tail end of winter in 1312, and Mansa Muhammad ibn Q is pacing frantically as he waits for word of what has happened to his men. Such pacing has become his routine over the last few weeks. 
10 months ago, his executive officer and a fleet of ships set off on an unprecedented expedition on the Atlantic Ocean. But not a single carrier pigeon has returned home. Mansu Muhammad is playing out the worst possible scenarios in his head. Could my advisors have been right? Did I take on too much? Could my men be dead? All of them? But he consoles himself with the knowledge the fleet was well-manned and well-equipped. He had signed off on 200 ships filled with crew members and another 200 filled with gold, water, and enough supplies to sustain them for years. Allah must have sensed that Muhammad was reaching a breaking point because at midday, when the sun was highest in the sky, he got exactly what he was praying for, a sign. Mansa Muhammad's ears perk up as he hears the blowing of horns. A servant burst into his quarters, breathing heavily. Mansa, a, a ship approaches the shore. It's, it's one of yours, my sultan. The servant is so excited he forgets to bow to his king. Muhammad's overcome by a sense of joy and doesn't even notice. But as quickly as that joy came, it fades. A single ship? That can't be right. Just then, a group of servants escort a single man into Muhammad's quarters. Captain Shabazz, Mashallah, you have returned home. What of the others? Shabazz does not look at his king. Muhammad yells in frustration. Shabazz, what news do you bring? Shabazz's eyes meet Muhammad's. They are filled with tears. Oh, Sultan, we traveled for such a long time until a river appeared in the open sea. The current was so powerful, mine was the last of those ships. The other ships went on ahead, but when they reached that place, they did not return. And no more was seen of them, and we do not know what became of them. As for me, I went about at once and did not enter that river. Muhammad's face turns. I don't believe you. Do you think me of a fool? A river in the middle of a sea? Shabazz is stunned in the silence. Muhammad turns to his most highly regarded servant, Farba, and whispers into his ear. Farba marches into the palace foyer with his high gold ceilings and yells, Mansa Muhammad commands 2,000 ships be convened by month's end. That is all. Over the next month, Thousands of shipwrights worked tirelessly to repair and ready 2,000 ships. 1,000 ships carried Muhammad and his men. The other 1,000 carried water and provisions. Once again, his advisors tell him that he is being too ambitious. But like many people of historical note, he lets his haters be his motivators. And at least one person believed in Muhammad's mission, his nephew, Musa. You could even say he seemed giddy. Did he know something his uncle didn't? As Muhammad says his farewells, he gives his family a knowing glance. He knew there was a good chance he'd never see them again. And that's just fine with Musa. Because although he's not even close to being at the top of the list of succession to be king, he's been watching the throne. Okay, so before we go too deep, we need a quick history lesson for context. The Mansa, or king, who initially united all the main territories in the Mali Empire, was Musa's great uncle, Sundiata Keita, also known as the Lion King. Which means, although Musa was raised and educated as a royal, he wasn't directly in line for the throne. In fact, he was actually ninth in the chain of succession. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. And he managed to get the crown anyway? I'm not implying he cut down his family on his way to the top or anything crazy like that. So what you saying, old? I'm just saying that the other uncle, Mansa Muhammad, the one that had the predilection for boats, didn't just die peacefully and pass on the crown to his beloved nephew. Nope. He, and I'm using air quotes here, disappeared at sea on an exploratory voyage. Why you use the air quotes? We, we all seen Titanic. And what happened to them explorers who tried to go sightseeing at the Titanic's crash site just last year? Oh, yeah. The ocean is a dangerous place, especially way back then without all the technology and knowledge that we have now. Yes, but in this case, before his uncle, King Muhammad, left for his journey, he named Musa as his heir and successor in a ceremony that no one seems to have a record of. 
<laughs> Wait, what? Why, what? That sounds like a hostile takeover to me. It's something of a question mark over Musa's rise to power, but not a ton of historians buy this line of thinking, so it might just be that this happened in the 1300s and the records of this didn't survive, which sometimes happens. Look, look at look at you throwing some salt on Mansa Musa's <laughs> good name with no proof. How no, dare you? No, 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 no. That's, that's not what's... Okay, listen. History did leave us with some context clues. Whether it was fate or not, Musa went on to become one of the most influential leaders in the empire's history after he crowned himself Mansa. And he reigned with kindness and respect. The end. But if that's how you would have reigned, I would like you to be in charge of everything. But no... Mansa Musa was in his early 20s, so he was a glorified man-child. Maybe it was insecurity or a desire to prove himself or power and dominance he was after, but the first years of Mansa Musa's reign were spent constantly at war, and that's not good for anybody. You seek the key, but first you must learn the ways of precision, craft, and performance— with Acura's all-electric ZDX. With a premium Bang & Olufsen sound system up to a 313-mile range on a single charge and a Type S variant with an estimated 500 horsepower, the ZDX is their most powerful SUV yet. Unlock the energy when you visit Acura.com to order yours today. Hi, I'm Kevin Blackstone, joined by my co-host, historian Robert Green II, on a podcast about today's southern cities, presented by the Levine Museum of the New South. You know what I'm saying? It's like we got a demo tape and nobody want to hear it, but it's like, this the South got something to say. On Our New South, we discuss how the South is evolving with academics, activists, and creatives. Coming from a place of curiosity, we want to find out what the idea of the New South means to them trying to tackle today's challenges, discovering how we got here and where it's going. The term New South is one of these containers. To me, the New South is inclusion. I don't know if I would say that we're in the New South. I think we're in the midst of transition. Our New South is presented by the Levine Museum of the New South in Charlotte, North Carolina, and produced by Next Chapter Podcast. With the generous support from the Knight Foundation. Please tell your friends and family about the show. Follow Our New South on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your pods. Thanks for listening. Black is beautiful. It's the fall of 1312. Mansa Musa and his crew are chilling in this epic hall facing a massive map of the Malian Empire. The generals are dressed in their finery for an audience with Mansa Musa as they propose plans for their military forces to push into new territory. They're all huddled up, scheming and planning their next big move. The vibes are good for some, considering their young king, Musa, racked up some impressive wins early on. And while that's good for morale, the empire was also constantly at war for years, and that takes a toll. As Mansa Musa's final general steps forward, he offers a fresh perspective. Look, this place we're eyeing is pretty pint-sized. No need for a heavy-handed approach. Let's be smooth and talk them into joining up. We'll lay out the perks, access to our mosques, trade routes, and the added bonus of our armies keeping trouble at bay, all in exchange for some taxes paid back to us. What do you think? I don't know why they're born him when he's right. I don't know. I just blame toxic masculinity on most stuff throughout history. Anyway, the general continues. <laughs> they're mostly farmers anyway. Any fight would be unnecessary bloodshed for them and possibly for us. The last part quiets the reactions in the hall. Mansa Musa responds by pointing out his favorite servant, Farba. He had inherited him upon his uncle's death. Do you know why Farba is my favorite? It is because he does what I ask of him. So when I ask my generals to present plans for battle, that is what I expect. I I got a lot to, it's a lot to unpackage with this one before we even go any further. So not only do we got a, 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 a somewhat of a a hostile takeover, what they would call with a, 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 a coup, potentially. We also got a little bit of a classism in, um, is it folk a slave? Yeah, I mean, it's it is interesting to think about 
like a 20 year old suddenly coming into power and like the ego that comes along with that and feeling like you need to prove yourself. Like people didn't want you there. You're young. You got to throw your weight around. Um, so I, I think you're right. There's like classism there. There's maybe a little ageism happening as well. Um, and then even you know, just, and, and you know, my grandpa used to say too. my grandpa used to say that a lot of men are young, dumb and full of <laughs> until they turn about 40. Oh my God. <laughs> Please bleep that out. Producers. <laughs> My <laughs> no, I loved it. I loved it. <laughs> now, remember, Mansa Musa was most likely the only 20-something in the room. Musa is tough. Sure, he comes off like a jerk of a king like Joffrey from Game of Thrones, but internally, he's constantly trying to prove he belongs in his position. Anyway, Musa's general tries to smooth things over with him by praising their troop strength before moving on to the benefits of diplomacy. The general says, those who can be convinced to join us willingly are less likely to fight to their last if diplomacy is not even attempted. Mansa Musa smiles at his general. So you are worried. The small amount of confidence in the general vanishes. The arguments on behalf of diplomacy have not taken root. Mansa, I, I do not doubt you or your resolve, says the general, trying to smooth things over. After a tense moment, Musa smiles and nods. I believe you. I also believe you are merciful. You would know when those who will fight to their last are truly at their last, which is why you and your troops will lead us to our victorious push into this new territory. The general bows deeply embarrassed and slinks back in the room as the meeting continues. Mansa Musa's will was clear. Mali would continue to grow by showing strength, and his generals would provide the muscle, no matter how uncomfortable they were with the idea. Just to sprinkle some context in, let me ask you, just how big was the Mali Empire at this point? Okay, if you were trying to lay the territories of the Empire of Mali controlled in the 1300s over a present-day map, it would be the size of California three times over or just shy of the size of Texas two times over. And that's why this show is amazing. It's about deconstructing all those primitive understandings that black folks came from Africa and we was just un, un, uh, uncivilized and we didn't have no technologies and all that. Mm -hmm. And the story of Mansa Musa is just single-handedly able to just disprove that. The, the, the more we get into this series, it's really going to be a asking the question, damn near at every new part we get into is like, how come we ain't got no movie yet? How, how come we ain't got no, no, no Netflix series or, you know, Amazon Prime original or something? It's, it's giving Game of Thrones meets Succession. I mean, just like the levels of people like trying to get to the top and how much money is being involved and how big this kingdom is like i can just see in my mind like the sets it's giving you know emmy winning uh costume design oscar nominees like i'm you know what i mean like this is this has some prestige to it all right well listen the powers that be that are listening just when you make the movie put conscious and i in it i i i you know i'm I'm ready. I'm ready. We got the chops. I'm I'm ready to see the story on the big screen. Yeah, listen, I'm I'm ready to play Mansa, you know, or the servant, you know? <laughs> I feel like in the 1300s in Europe, it was like the dark ages. Yeah, the Black Death, the Great Famine, like <laughs> oh, this is <laughs> this is the 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 the, the 1300s. Mm. You feel me just north in Europe is not is 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 not very good times. Yeah. I think that it's always important to contextualize what's going on throughout the world when you're thinking about what's happening in like African antiquity times. Yeah, and just thinking about the size is also, I think, really important too, because a lot of today's modern day ma maps really don't show the scale of the continent of Africa, and that is intentional. So I think it's really important to think about like we are not talking about a small little neighborhood. We are talking about a ginormous area. And you, know, you think about how big Texas is, you think about how big California is, and you can have 
snow, you can have beach, you can have desert, because this is a big ass state. Like this, we're talking about a massive amount of land here. Oh yeah, definitely. As somebody that's born and raised in Texas, it's hard enough traveling through the state in just a car. Think about it. On my mama, you can drive over 12 hours from one part of Texas to the other part of Texas and still be in Texas. I can't imagine how you could do that on a camel. And think about it. Two times sized over Texas. Oh, that's man. damn near like yeah. the entire South. Listen, I rode a camel one time and it was awful. My butt was hurting. <laughs> I was on a camel for 30 minutes and I was like, this stinks. <laughs> Literally and so figuratively. You, so, you, so you couldn't do it for a couple oh of days. Oh my then. God. No. Are you kidding me? A traveler way back in the day said that it took them about four months to travel from the northern borders of the Mali empires to the Ninani in the south. I ain't trying to do like a six hour flight. A four month? Four months. <laughs> <laughs> like, nah, you can have it. You keep Yo, it. you leave the house looking all young and fresh and you show up like gray hairs and circles under your eyes. That's a long, long trip. Hey, listen, ain't no bonnet or do-rag keeping no hairstyle <laughs> head held up for the four months. You feel me? Like, think about it. Braids you go hanging to the airport on a thread. <laughs> what? You jump fresh to go because you, when you get there, you want to be fresh. Ain't no way in hell you finna get clean for a four-month <laughs> travel. Like, get there and need a whole shave, hair done, <laughs> everything. Molly's trades ranged from silks to salt to slaves and, of course, the gold mines. They pulled so much gold out of their land and spent it so hard, it said the first time Europe took notice of Africa was when they heard the tales of Musa's flashy gold ways of his travels. In fact, there was a Catalan atlas made in 1375 with a depiction of him holding a golden staff in one hand and a huge chunk of gold in the other. Then, on top of his head is a huge golden crown. Oh, he was pitying a fool before Mr. T. He was the OG Trinidad James, all gold, everything before Trinidad James, huh? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on though. It seemed like it's something missing. It seemed like it's something. You, you kind of skipped over something, didn't you? What? The slaves. M- Mansa Musa was a slaver? Yes, and not that this is an excuse for him, but back then, slavery, quote unquote, meant something different than the chattel slavery that black folks faced during the transatlantic slave trade 160 years ago. Well, goddamn, Francesca, you blacks are always (laughs) making up excuses for when we talk about slavery. Y'all enslaved Uh, yourselves first. You you, you did it to yourself, see, see what it sounds like to me. Yeah. The reason why we have a black history for real is because your people sold you into slavery. Yeah. Okay. Listen, I'm not saying that, that that slavery was good. I'm not saying that in any way, shape or form. They were still slaves. Yes. And and for the people listening in the back. Sprinkle a little of my academic, you know, knowledge right here. You know, there are many distinctions between enslaved people. You know what I'm saying? You had prisoners of war. You had, you know, indigenous servants. You see what I'm saying? You had you had chattel slavery. You know what I mean? You had multiple forms of enslavement. And it's important that we give distinctions in historical context to the various textures of how one could be held captive. Because, you know, all slavery ain't the same. Yeah, and you're absolutely correct. And look, it's one of those unfortunate truths about amassing mind-boggling wealth. It's almost always brought about by taking from or subjugating others, and Mansa Musa was no different. But in addition to slaves and the other items they were known for trading, Mali also controlled the trade routes, which meant that the title of Mansa was incredibly powerful and Musa was unspeakably rich. Oh, yeah. When I was in college and getting my degree in human relations, I learned how migration routes and how like distribution of wealth or the lack thereof is always how you're able to trace the power and the domination. And what we see with Mansa Musa is they ain't immune to it. But despite his already vast wealth and power, the one thing history has taught us about the rich and powerful, they always want more. But how much more? During the period of Musa's early reign, Mali was at war so often, it estimated 24 new territories were added to the empire. It almost sounds like these was like the Romans. Yeah, anytime you look at historical figures, no matter how much good they do in the end, we have to remember that they are ultimately just flawed humans. Mansa Musa didn't start out his reign being perfect. 
but the blocks used to build him into the man he turned out to be are worth examination. On a sunny day, as Musa brings his sons home from the mosque, their entourage of royal guards and service take the scenic route. The peaceful walk is interrupted when one of the boys looks up and excitedly calls out for his grandmother, who's appeared out of nowhere. Musa is surprised to see his mother and releases his children into her arms before their minders collect them and take them away. Kanku waves as the boys disappear before turning to focus on her son. Is it so wrong that I would want to see my son before he disappears on yet another conquest? Musa is unmoved and Kanku pivots. There's a general feeling of unrest swirling around and I think it could be helpful if we listened to other learned men. Mansa begins to walk as his mother slips her arm into his and keeps pace. We all have our gifts. Your late uncle left us on an exploratory mission that took him in the end, but at least he went doing what he loved best, expanding his knowledge, not just his territories. Mansa Musa finally responds to his mother. Before uncle left us, he spoke about our duties to our people in our kingdom. It is beyond your understanding. I've never been a Mansa, it's true. But do you never worry that you'll ride off for some distant land and never return? What would happen to your sons? Couldn't you take a few years off for their sake? The rapid fire questions proved to be too much and Mansa explodes on his mother in a fit of rage. Mother! The servants and the guards stop moving and avert their eyes to give the king and his mother privacy. I will not be a weak Mansa, because you do not have the stomach for it. If you spoke to my uncle about such things, you would know he views standing still as a dereliction of duty. Musa turns to his guards. See my mother to her quarters. I believe she's had too much sun and taken leave of her senses. Cancun reaches for Musa but the royal guards position themselves between mother and son, placing him out of reach. Son, please. I would not see you for quite some time, mother. I have an empire to lead. Musa turns heel and leaves Kanku with the guards. Every day, our world gets a little more connected but a little further apart. But then, there are moments that remind us to be more human. Thank you for calling Amica Insurance. Hey, uh, I was just in an accident. Don't worry, we'll get you taken care of. At Amica, we understand that looking out for each other isn't new or groundbreaking. It's human. Amica, empathy is our best policy. In the dead of night, the imam paces in the castle's courtyard, nervously whispering duas to himself in order to steal his nerves. He's praying to Allah for guidance, when suddenly, the large wrought iron doors open and the royal brigade returns. Mansa Musa and his guard enter fresh off a of victory on the battlefield. The imam attempts to get Musa's attention. Y- your majesty, I-, I assure you, we called every healer. Musa cuts off the annoying cleric. Not now. We've just got in. You're going to celebrate a new spice trade, and then I will hear about the healers. Musa's soldiers head towards the castle doors. When the cleric realizes his window is closing, he boldly steps in front of the king. I know you said it was an accident, and I believe you, my king, but even accidents have consequences. We called in every healer, but we were too late. Your mother, I'm afraid she has succumbed to her injuries. Mansa Musa stands very still, in shock, trying to make sense of what he's just heard. Succumbed? You mean my my mother is dead? I am so sorry for your great loss, your majesty. May the Almighty Allah bestow you comfort and patience. 
Mansa Musa sinks to his knees, but the imam catches him to prevent him from falling further. The peace you are seeking is not mine to give. It is through Allah. As a boy, you were a fine student. Do you remember your teachings? Musa silently nods. In times like these, I find it is helpful to remember the Quran. Indeed, we belong to Allah, and indeed to Him we will return. The word is designed to comfort fall short as Musa chokes out the truth. It was an accident, I swear. I didn't mean it. The imam holds his young king in his arms and feeds him comforting passages from the Quran. The conversation with Musa carries out past the night and with the sun's rising to the next day. Musa's distraught spirit seeks the peace that he can only find in Allah. But eventually their time comes to an end. As Mansa Musa finds his strength to enter the castle, he turns to the imam and pledges to return to the mosque every night to make prayers and to continue to search for peace. Thank you. You've always offered wise counsel, even when I've been too stubborn to hear it. The imam bows deeply as Musa takes his leave. So, so hold on, hold on, hold on. When he said it was an accident, I swear I didn't mean it. He killed his own mama? There's a West African chronicle written in Arabic called Tariq El Fatshish that holds the most detailed record of the events of this period. And according to it, yes, Mansa Musa was directly responsible for his own mother's death. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm missing some context. Like, did, did it say how? How is not specified. Just that there was an accident and that Mansa Musa experiences deep regret and guilt that alters him. I sure as hell hope so. I can't imagine being responsible for the death of a person who bought you into this world. Because, you know, as black folks always heard, I bought you into this world, now I take you out. So, like, you doing it to your own mama is kind of crazy. Uh, yeah, and it, it also serves as a turning point in who Mansa Musa is. The grief and guilt that Musa feels for this act is documented, and him seeking out ways to deal with his guilt sets him on a religious path. Yeah, that's heavy. What, what was the catalyst for this turn away from war? Musa didn't do a 180 in his behavior when it came to pushing into new and different territories, but historical texts point to there being a notable change in how devout of a Muslim he was after the death of his mother. Hey man, the, 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 the devotion and guilt in the Lord definitely will, you know, give you a change of heart sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a very, very convenient timing in that respect. He, like most, was born into his religion, so it's not as if he converted, but his motivations for his empire's growth changed. He was no longer adding cities for just the economic purposes. He kept expanding, but vowed to spread Islam throughout his territories. This rubbed some people the wrong way, because some of the cities he acquired observed traditional African religions that were pagan. Hold on, hold on. This is black history for real. We ain't, we ain't pushing no white supremacist gazes at all. What do you mean by pagan? Only that their religions included many gods instead of just one. When Musa took over a new area, he didn't force conversion, but it seems like the old ways were pushed to the side, or at the very least, deprioritized. Oh. Smells like... Mm, okay, okay. Tastes like, okay, 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 let me look at it again. It looked like, sound like, smell like we still talking about colonialism. Um, my yeah, not you doing a little wine tasting. Listen, you're not wrong, okay? You're not wrong. But Mansa Musa began an ambitious program to build mosques and libraries everywhere he went, okay? So instead of waging war, he often tried diplomacy. He sought to make himself a holy man, not just a ruler and a leader. <laughs> Fine, this man sound like a, a, a Western Christian evangelist looking to spread the good gospel of the Lord. So e everywhere he went, not just his empire, huh? One of the five pillars of Islam is the pilgrimage of the holy city of Mecca that all Muslims are encouraged to make at least once in their lives. One of the things Mansa Musa is known for is making a pilgrimage that became one of the most opulent in history. 
The Holy Land in Mecca was a 4,000 mile journey of rough terrain from his palace that would take nearly two years to complete. So to answer your question, yes, he made a few stops along the way. It's winter 1313, the dead of night. The Malian troops keep a tight formation as they march down a dirt road, defined mostly from cattle grazing. The troops keep their heads on a swivel as the sun hangs low in the sky. They have enemies near and far, old and new. As they approach the little farming village, the trees grow sparse and the grass is unwieldy and high. The general riding on his horse holds up his fist. The head of a small boy, a goat farmer, hops up out the tall grass. He studies the troops briefly before disappearing from sight. The general murmurs to his troops, steady. The troop remains statue-like as the sun sets and the darkness takes hold. The goats roam free having been abandoned by their caretaker. Then in the darkness comes another sound, the snap of a twig. The general lifts his fist once more. Keep to the plan. They have to come to us. The general then opens his palm, drops the reins of his horse bit, and shows his other palm. The general raises his voice. I come to you with the peace of Allah on behalf of Mansa Musa of Mali. He waves at his troops encouragingly. One by one, the troops begin to drop their weapons and show the palms of their empty hands to the darkness around them. After a brief pause, the men of the village emerge from the tree line, carrying lit torches, sharpened stones, and clubs, each man ready to defend their home. The general slides from his horse and approaches the leader of the villagers. I offer you a chance to join the great empire of Mali. We will build you schools, mosques, roads, and you will have access to our trade routes. And most importantly, you will have the empire's protection if you agree to join of your own will. The leader looks between the general and his men. Their sharpened weapons gleaming in the torchlight land mere inches away. The implied outcome if they were to reject the offer is clear. And so the first wave of Malian diplomacy begins an offer to join, and a show of strength to back it up. But little does the general know his king Mansa Musa is in turmoil as a result of his mother's death. So that begs the question, in this state of mind, can Mansa Musa lead the great Malian empire? If you like black history for real, you can listen early and ad-free right now by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app or on Apple Podcasts. Prime members can listen ad-free on Amazon Music. Before you go, tell us about yourself by filling out a short survey at Wondery.com survey. This is episode one of the three-part series, Mansa Musa and the Mali Empire. We use multiple sources when researching our stories, but National Geographic, the corpus of early Arabic sources for Western African history, and a cultural history of Atlantic world by John K. Horton were extremely helpful. A note, our scenes contain reenactments and dramatized details for narrative cohesiveness. Follow Black History For Real on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. Black History For Real was hosted by me, Conscious Lee. And me, Francesca Ramsey. Black History For Real is a production of Wondery and DCP Entertainment. This episode was written by Lauren Williams. Sound designed by Greg Schweitzer. The theme song is by Terrace Martin. For DCP Entertainment, associate producers are Quentin Hill, Brittany Temple, and Chris Colbert. The senior producer is Ryan Woodhall. Executive producers for DCP Entertainment are Adele Coleman and DJ Tracy Treese. For Wondery, Lindsay Gomez is the development producer. The production coordinator is Desi Blaylock. Sophia Martins is our managing producer. Our producer is Matt Gant. Our senior story editor is Phyllis Fletcher. The executive producers for Wondery are Marshall Louie, Erin O'Flaherty, and Candice Manriquez-Ren. Wondery.